I think that we have a strict time, so we have to start in time. Just a few, thank you for being here and for attending to the workshop. And if, a quick note, you have 15 minutes, including questions. And it's very important that you follow the schedule. Okay. So um, I will start this session with the first paper that is entitled Predicting Remaining Cycle Time from Ongoing in Cases, a Survival Analysis Based Approach. The speaker is Fadi Bashkaran. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, if someone will want to formulate a question at the end of the session, I can write something on the chat. I will uh, uh, report the question. Uh, okay, can I start to share my screen? Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, one moment. So just let me know if uh, the screen or the presentation is uh, visible to you. Yes, perfect. And I think the camera is on now, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, thank you and good morning, uh, afternoon and evening to everyone uh, to this talk. Uh, this is uh, Paddy speaking. Uh, about the paper predicting remaining cycle time from ongoing cases. The work is done by me, Fadi Baskarun, uh, Ahmed Awad, and Chiara Di Francesco Marin. Uh, first, let me uh, introduce to you an example of the problem that we are trying to solve here. Uh, imagine a process of a help disk ticketing system uh, that may include uh, some events like uh, ticket received, ticket dispatched, ticket escalated, and so on uh, of activities. And at any point in time, I want to predict or know when this ticket is going to be resolved in order to intervene if uh, something goes wrong or something. Uh, another example of process could be of device logs, where the events can be warnings, can be a different alarm or uh, different errors at, at, uh, at any point in time. Uh, I also want to know when uh, there will be a failure or the device will break uh, in order to um, have precautions or to take preventive measures. So mathematically speaking, we can formulate uh, this problem uh, that we have a set of uh, events from uh, E minus N being the oldest event and E zero being the most recent event. Those events are called the prefix of uh, the trace that uh, are going to help me to uh, predict the remaining time until this process ends. Each event uh, is transformed into a set of features, F1 to Fm. Those features are mainly time-related features to capture both uh, the time-related or the time difference between uh, the events and the type of the activity that uh, happened in this uh, event. So, uh, Possible approaches. People uh, tend to think about this problem like a regression problem where we can uh, transform the remaining time uh, into a continuous uh, variable x. And uh, from uh, the features that I just explained, we can formulate it uh, uh, or we can construct our training data set uh, in a window like uh, uh, representation, uh, whether using uh, just simple machine learning algorithm or uh, LSTMs or more complex uh, deep neural network uh, algorithms. And the time is just a continuous uh, variable, like I said. Actually, this method answers the question that or the problem that we are trying to solve. It, uh, at the end, it tells you a number uh, representing the remaining uh, time until the process ends. However, there are some pitfalls or some drawbacks in this method in general uh, uh, that it cannot be trained on incomplete traces. And sometimes we have in our training or the available data will be much more of incomplete traces or partial traces than uh, the complete ones. 
And actually, this point leads us to the second uh, drawback, which is that our model will be prone to short estimate bias because it will learn only from completed traces within the uh, the time span of our data set. So if our data set uh, has a time span of one month and the process usually ends after one month, our model will not uh, going to be uh, able to uh, extrapolate beyond uh, the one month uh, period. Uh, the last thing is that uh, it doesn't actually provide, usually regression models doesn't provide a confidence estimate about the prediction uh, it gives. Uh, so another approach actually that we may think about is a classification uh, approach where we can use the same input representation, but this time uh, the output is represented as zero or one whether or not we will uh, uh, we will have in the next period of time we will observe uh, uh, the end of the trace uh, actually some model actually can give you uh, let me bring this pointer be better yeah uh, some models can give you um, an estimate probability like for example uh, the logistic regression um, uh, it can give you some estimate about the prediction and it can be trained on incomplete traces because we don't focus on the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, trace lifetime, we only focus on the next uh, interval, so we can train on partial traces. But actually it answers a different question, not when the trace will end, it answers whether or not it will end in the next interval of time. And the interval of time is a hyperparameter of the model that we can change. We can make it large or small. And even it doesn't answer when in this interval of time uh, the process uh, uh, will end. A last thing uh, that it is prone to false negative bias since most of our data set, it depends on the data set, but usually most of the data set will have uh, a zero label uh, records than uh, one label uh, records. So, can we have a better approach? Uh, and this is our contribution is uh, is here. We need a model actually to um, that is designed to predict time or to understand time as time, not as um, a continuous, uh, just a continuous variable. We need a model that benefits from incomplete traces in order to make use of all uh, the available data set, uh, even if it's not a complete trace. Uh, the third point, we need a model that gives us an estimate of the prediction, not just a number telling us uh, when the trace will end or the process will end. Uh, and we need a model to answer maybe even more uh, sophisticated questions. So uh, the proposed solution lies in the survival uh, analysis approach, where it is widely used in the medical field uh, to estimate uh, the, uh, the remaining lifetime of patients uh, based on different uh, treatment. Uh, we used the, almost the same technique here uh, in order to predict the probability density function of the remaining time, uh, uh, the probability density function of a weighable distribution, which is a popular time-based uh, distribution. Uh, with all the possible remaining times in the x-axis from zero to infinity <clears throat> and in the y-axis uh, is a likelihood and we can see <clears throat> sorry uh, we can see that uh, our trained model is able at the end to predict or to draw a probability density function that has a very high likelihood around the actual uh, remaining time of this trace in the uh, green circle here uh, and imagine how many questions we can answer just from this distribution. Another uh, graph we can draw from this distribution is the survival curve of the Weber distribution, where any point in this graph, uh, maybe this red point here tells us that uh, there is a 20% probability that the trace survives after uh, 28 days. 
And uh, this makes sense that we have quite low probability because uh, the predicted remaining time was actually around seven or 10 days. Uh, the way we construct our data set, the features are the same actually, but the labels here we have uh, two kind of uh, categories, like uh, we can say. Uh, this here uh, represents that the remaining time is four, but we actually didn't observe the actual end of the process. This is just the end of our data set. So you here is uh, an observation flag. Uh, and the other type of records is nine here is the remaining time but we actually did see uh, the end of the trace within our data set this is the way uh, survival analysis work uh, so uh, we have successfully uh, fulfilled our four points that we talked about uh, about the model architecture we have uh, I would say simple uh, two hidden GRU layers followed by two batch normalization layers. Uh, the input size is prefix length times number of features. Uh, the feature vector here is, as I said, uh, a, a combination of time related features and activa uh, activity type represented in one hot representation. The labels are T and U, like I just explained, and uh, the predictions are alpha and beta. The alpha and beta are the shape and the scale uh, uh, parameters of this Weibull distribution. Uh, the four parameters T, U, alpha, and beta are the input of uh, the loss function, which is the negative log of a very special uh, likelihood function. The aim of this uh, likelihood or of this optimization function is to uh, maximize uh, the likelihood of the probability density function around T if the end of the trace has really observed. Uh, or to maximize uh, the survival curve of the Weibull distribution beyond T if we just, uh, uh, if T is just the end of our data not the end of the trees. Uh, so uh, the label transformation step might be needed and we used it uh, uh, for some data sets, data set A, B, and C, where uh, the number of events per trace are uh, right skewed. So consequently, uh, the remaining time uh, is right skewed. So in order to have a better uh, label distribution, somehow uh, normally distributed, we used a different technique of uh, label transformation. Uh, as for the evaluation, we have performed three experiments in uh, green and red and purple. Um, they are just combination of different percentage of observed and censored trace or partial traces. Uh, and with or without uh, the label transformation. And we compared it with uh, the baseline in blue. We can see, uh, given that uh, the y-axis uh, is the mean absolute error, so the shorter is better. And the x-axis is uh, the number of the prefix or the prefix length used to train the model. The numbers above here are the number of the test uh, traces used in order to generate those uh, results. So uh, given all these, uh, we can see that our models actually excel compared to the baseline, especially for the long uh, traces or the long processes. And we do as good or even better in some uh, experiments uh, in the short traces. Uh, as for the time, uh, performance, we train in green here in a much lower or much less time uh, than the baseline does. Um, as a conclusion, uh, survival analysis uh, fits time prediction problems better than regression because it actually understands time. GRU models uh, or GRU networks handles the time varying features because actually uh, survival analysis model alone cannot deal with time varying features. We have made uh, a 
cycle prediction library that it is ready sorry, to use. Sorry, for... I think your, your screen is uh, frozen. Um, oh. uh, can you try? I avoided stopping him because he have short time and I would ah, okay. avoid. Okay, yeah. but he's at the conclusion because he is uh, out of his time, so I avoided stopping him. Uh, okay, um, I don't know. Let me try to. Uh... Yes, please go ahead. Yes, please complete because uh, we are already out of the time. Uh, okay, I would just say that uh, there is a cycle prediction library used uh, already to use to uh, perform similar uh, uh, experiments. There is a QR code here, but uh, obviously you cannot uh, scan it uh, in order to uh, see the documentation. And for future work, we need to compare with more baselines um, as well as investigate the optimum training uh, uh ratio of observed and sensor traces uh in future so yeah thank you thank you uh, we have time just for one quick question okay so i think that uh, you will discuss offline uh, using also the platform wova so it's time for the second speaker. And uh, the paper is a uh, Time Matters, uh, Time Aware LSTMs for Predictive Business Process Monitoring. Uh, the speaker is uh, Anna Neguyen. Please uh, uh, keep in time. Thank you. Hey. Hello. Hello, can you see my slides? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Good, yeah, welcome everyone to my talk on time aware LSTMs for predictive business process monitoring. So I want to start with a brief introduction. So we usually have historic data in form of an event log for any business process, it can be a ticketing process um, for a customer service, or it can be a manufacturing process or any process, which we usually process to derive some kind of predictive model or train some predictive model, which you can then use in production, for example, in order to analyze running cases and to do answer questions like, um, yeah, what's the next activity in our case or the next timestamp, which can be very helpful in, in a variety of applications. So, um, yeah, and there's increasing uh, body of literature working on creating such models, which is also the focus in this talk here. So the baseline um, of this work is um, the work of Taxi et al. from 2017, uh, where we have a multitask learning architecture um, based with a shared LSTM layer here and a specialized path to predict the next activity where usually a cross entropy loss is applied. And we have a specialized layer for the timestamp prediction, which is a regression program, uh, where we use the mean absolute error loss. And the total loss uh, in tax et al is the simple sum of cross entropy loss and mean absolute error loss. And we will use this architecture as a baseline. So um, we were looking at the event log data tax et al used, which was help desk and BPI 12. And we did some observations. So the first observation is here. If you look at the distribution of activities of those event logs, then you can observe that they are highly skewed distributions. And the main problem is that the next activity prediction is usually modeled as a multi-class classification problem. And, and the skewed distribution of activities is usually not taken care of. That's observation one. And the second thing is, if you look at RNN architectures uh, of the shelf and LSTMs, RNNs, or GRUs, you name it, um, you usually assume, or those models usually assume a regular timing between two events or two time steps you input, if you input the sequence. But if you look at the timing between two events in those event log this and BPI-12, you can see that those are also very irregular. So if we even zoom in and to all the events with a duration lesser equal than a day, and then we can see this distribution in terms of seconds. 
So um, the hypothesis is um, also here that uh, we should um, take into consideration the time information between two events um, when we perform predictive business process monitoring. So based on those two observations, um, we want to propose a few solutions. So we want to take care of the skewed activity distribution by introducing cost sensitive learning. So um, as you can see here, we do this by simply adding the weights or weights uh, to the cross entropy loss. And the weights are calculated based on the frequency of a specific activity in the training data set. Um, yeah, scaled by the, by the number of activities in general and also by uh, the number of classes in order to have approximately the same magnitude of uh, loss value for the cross entropy and the cost sensitive cross entropy loss. So this is how we would um, try to handle the skewed activity distribution. In order to model the event duration between uh, events, um, we want to introduce the time aware LSTM architecture, which we call TLSTM, in order to model the irregular event durations. And I go a little bit more in detail about the TLSTM architecture. Um, here you can see the block diagram. I think most of you know the block diagram for an LSTM. So this is actually the same if you look outside and without the blue parts. So I highlighted the time aware part uh, for you here and we'll go through the calculation step by step. So the main idea is actually that we don't use just the previous cell memory, but adjust it by doing a subspace decomposition and to transform it. So first of all, um, we use a linear transformation with the tongue age activation function in order to extract this uh, short-term memory with learnable weights W and B. We then use this short-term memory and discount it by a monotonic uh, de um, decreasing decay function um, based on the time, uh, time step at time T and T minus one, which we call data T. And the choice of the decay function in our case is this one. Since we model the data T's or input the data T's in terms of seconds and have very large numbers, which is why we use this logarithmic scale. But of course, any monotonic decreasing decay function would work. We then extract the long-term memory, which is the previous cell memory, the original one, minus the calculated short-term memory. And finally, um, the adjusted previous memory is nothing else but the long-term memory plus the discounted short-term memory. And we can then use this adjusted previous memory to do the normal LSTM calculations uh, as you are used to based on the current input, previous hidden state and adjusted previous cell memory. And we do this of course in a in, in recurrent manner um, for all time steps one to K where K is usually um, the prefix length. So um, to sum up, um, we actually adjust an LSTM, uh, the normal LSTM cell um, by doing subspace decomposition of the cell memory in order to model the time gaps between the events. So in order to show the effectiveness of those two approaches, um, we did a small ablation study where we split as in Tuxet I, um, the data into two third training and one third uh, testing cases by preserving the temporal order of the cases. We also use the last 20% of the training data in order to do hyperparameter tuning. In this case, we performed grid search and we use the Tuxet I architecture as a baseline, as you can see here, and then once at the cost sensitive learning part by um, replacing the cross entropy with the weighted cross entropy loss. And we also replace the LSTM layers with TLSTM layers. And furthermore, we also try to combine both approaches by replacing the LSTM layers by TLSTM layers and the cross entropy loss by the weighted cross entropy loss. Okay, okay. 
So if we look at results for the next activity prediction, which we evaluated based on accuracy measure as in Tux et al, um, we can see that we get the best results by the combination of um, cost-sensitive learning and TLSDMs. But of course, note that the improvements are relatively small, so not very mind-blowing uh, results here for the next activity prediction. But for the next time set prediction, things get a little bit more interesting. Here you can see that all approaches um, yielded a significant improvement in terms of mean absolute error compared to the baseline for help this data set a uh, little bit less than a day improvement in mean absolute error for all approaches. And for the DPI 12 data set, um, yeah, more than half a day improvement in terms of mean absolute error. And surprisingly, we get the best results by only introducing cost-sensitive learning, um, even though the results um, for all three um, approaches here are in a similar range. But nonetheless, uh, there was an interesting observation for us. So in conclusion, um, we introduced cost-sensitive learning to handle the good activity distributions and TLSCM to model the uh, irregular time gaps between two events for the PBBM uh, domain and observe the larger effect on the next time step prediction compared to the next activity prediction, even though it was beneficial for both tasks. And since this is work, and, and you can also find um, the code here on GitHub, um, open sourced, and um, there are some ideas or thoughts for future work and discussions and of course, um, we should perform a little bit more experiments to get more confidence on the effectiveness of the presented approaches. On the one hand, we should use more data sets um, to validate it. And what's also really common in the deep learning community is not only to do one run and report one accuracy value, but to do, for example, 10 runs with random initializations um, to, in order to take care of the randomness of deep neural networks and then present mean and standard derivations of the results. So I think that's something where in this community we should also aim for. And um, there's also the also better hyperparameter tuning schemas out there compared to grid search or random search. Um, for example, Bayesian optimization. There are nice libraries out there like Optuna and Hyperopt and many more, which you could use in order to get better models. And we can also try to integrate TLSTMs and cost-sensitive learning to other LSTM-based BPPM techniques. For example, and there was recently a GUN paper published uh, using LSTMs, where we could think of replacing LSTMs with TLSTMs. Um, we could think of different backpropagation schemas for this architecture here, since in Taxed I, we backpropagate the sum of those two losses for all weights. But we could also think about only updating the specialized grades based on the um, gradients of the um, distinct uh, losses of the specialized layers. And of course, um, we could uh, try uh, to solve other um, predictive business process management tasks, monitoring tasks like suffix prediction and remaining case duration prediction. And this paper and this work should also motivate everyone in order to think about and designing cells or computations uh, which take integrate other specific characteristic of event logs like for example context information okay and of course there are many more things we couldn't take care of with that i would like to thank you for your attention and i'm happy to take questions okay thank you for the talk any question Uh, there is a question from Paolo Ceravolo. Can you please elaborate more on the reason C is more effective than LSTM in your case? Why TLSTM is more effective? Yes, it's more uh, effective than LSTM in your case. You can also read the question in the chat. Ah, okay. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, reason CE, what, what, what is meant by CE? Or does he mean CS cost sensitive learning? 
this is one of the options that you reported in the slides. Uh, oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I think, I think um, cost sensitive learning is meant right here. Ah, or oh, the adjusted cost cross entropy. Yeah, it's um, because if we look at the, the loss function here, so what we have usually in machine learning when we have the, that's like an imbalance problem, right? So we have some classes, so activities are usually used as classes, uh, which are, um, yeah, le have less frequency than others in the common approach for much or like how machine learning algorithms sometimes cheat is that they just more often predict the majority classes because that yields high accuracy. Right, without doing much. If I would have 99% activity one, then a model which only predicts activity one would be 99% accurate. But we also want our models to be able to um, predict activities which are less um, prominent in the event block. Right, and this is what we want to for, uh, enforce um, by introducing this um, cost sensitive learning or weighted cost entropy loss. Okay. Does it answer your answer, uh, question, Paolo? Okay, okay. I think. Yeah. Okay. I think it's okay. 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 Thank you again to the speaker. Yeah. Thank okay. you, everyone. Yeah. Can you remove the desk? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Great. Okay. okay. Next talk is a preliminary study on uh, the application of reinforcement learning for predictive process monitoring. Monitoring. The speaker is uh, Andrea Chiorini. Nice to meet you. Okay, can you share the desktop? Uh, yes. Do you see it? Yes. Good. So, hi everybody, I'm Andrea Fiorini, a PhD student at Università Politecnica delle Marche. I'm here to present you a preliminary study on the application of reinforcement learning for predictive process monitoring. First of all, let's introduce the scope of this study, which is the predictive process monitoring subfield of PM, which could be synthesized as, uh, given a trace, predict what happens next. There are uh, several different tasks in this uh, field, such as uh, the prediction of uh, the next event to occur with both its timestamp and its activity, or uh, the prediction of the whole evolution of the trace considering both its duration and its sequence of activities. There are many related works in this regard. Some of them are uh, the following, but uh, <clears throat> we can see that many of them address these tasks using recurrent neural networks, in particular LSTM. Very recently, some works also try to use CNN. Uh, though um, these, not all the works addressed all the four tasks of our investigation, as some of them specialized uh, on uh, some specific tasks. Our proposal is to use uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning. And this is so as uh, in the past five years, reinforcement learning has achieved uh, uh, many great results. And uh, also because reinforcement learning is guided by an objective function that takes into account uh, all the chain of future decisions and its effects, instead of focusing only on the decision at end. And we think that these could be a very interesting features to exploit in the predictive process monitoring field. But what is reinforcement learning? Uh, reinforcement learning, it is uh, an alternative learning paradigm to supervised and unsupervised learning, or to cite Sutton and Barto, is learning what to do, how to map situations to actions, so as to maximize a numerical reward signal. In this setting, so we have uh, an agent which has as its goal a cumulative reward function expressed as, uh, in, as the formula in the cloud. And what it does is uh, to observe the environment in which it acts, learn, uh, understand the state of the environment. And on this basis, uh, uh, it performs an action. On the basis of both uh, the action and the environment and the state of the environment, the agent receives a reward from the environment for that time step. In particular, in our study, we used uh, a deep Q network agent, which is a type of RL agent that tries to approximate the optimal action value function, Q star, which is given a state and an action and a policy behavior that define how the agent acts 
the maximum expected cumulative reward obtained performing that action. The underlying idea of, uh, of this is that if we know two star at each time step, the agent could always choose the best course of action uh, to perform, to, to follow. Of course, knowing exactly two star, uh, it's always, uh, almost always impossible in non-trivial scenarios. Therefore, what is usually done is learning a, an approximation of it through the transition from a state to another and the action, as well as the received reward for that action. This is typically done approximating Q star through an ML model with weights theta. Mm, in particular, in our case, we used an LSTM neural network. And you can see that the training loss function is uh, is uh, exactly this. We are trying to minimize the distance between our approximation and the true optimal function. Uh, though we, we must notice uh, that um, is, uh is not something that we know. So the, what it is usually done is using an approximation of it, even for the target, which is uh, R plus Q tilde. We can see that uh, uh, this is uh, Q star for what, for what concerns R, but it is the approximation we know, we have, we have chosen for what concerns Q tilde. So to put it uh, in, uh, in a very simple way, we are learning Q star one R at a time. Our methodology uh, took into account, first of all, the, the reprocessing needed to feed the, our data, our log data to the, to the system. So we characterized each event in, uh, in a trace as, uh, um, as uh, composed by four logical components derived from the timestamp and the activity. So we used the one-hot encoding of the activity, the time passed between Sunday midnight and the event, the current event, the event that we are trying to characterize. Then we choose the time passed between the completion of the event and the completion of the previous event, including any idle time. And then we choose the time passed within the start of the trace and the current event completion. All those three temporal features were properly rescaled in range zero one, accordingly to the formulas you have at the, bond of, at the bottom of the slide. So we say that each event is characterized as expressed in this previous slide with a tool containing the encode of the activity and of the three temporal features. What each of our agents does is uh, taking, in, taking into account uh, as input a sequence of K of these events as window size. And uh, on the basis of these, uh, choosing an action that, that, is, uh, that, that, it, that is the prediction of the next activity or of the next execution time. It is important to notice here that uh, the QN agent only have discrete output as their uh, action space is discrete, so we had to discretize the time in bins. Here we can see the, the full architecture uh, of our approach, which during training, as the two agents don't uh, interact with each other, and just learning from the, their interaction with their respective environment. While during the prediction phase, we can see that they exchange their prediction, so to, pre so to produce uh, the full information needed uh, for the next event. So to be capable of uh, uh, predicting the whole execution of the trace, uh, uh, properly updating the sequence uh, that they use as input at the next time step. To properly uh, estimate the contribution of the real paradigm to the various tasks, we compared with other study that use LSTM networks with a supervised approach. We choose uh, as, uh, therefore, we choose as data set uh, BPI 2012W, which is a sub log of BPI 2012. And it is a log of a large financial institution where the W letter refers to the particular sub process, which is the work item sub process that contains events that are uh, manually executed. We also, we also chronologically ordered the data set and took the first 67% for the training and the last 33% for the tests. All these choices were made for uniformity reason to have the data set as similar as possible with that of the baseline. Here in this slide, I report the, all the main aspects related to the experimental setup of the paper. 
it is uh, also important to notice that uh, this experimental configuration was kept for all the test window size. To properly evaluate our study, um, we adopted the same metrics as the chosen baseline. So we, we choose the, the MI for the next execution time uh, estimation, where we used the, the inferior extreme to compute the, the delta, the, uh, the calculus of the difference. And we use the accuracy to, uh, to evaluate the performance on the next activity prediction. On the other end, on the suffix prediction, on the prediction of the whole execution of the trace, we choose the absolute trace duration error for the, for the error on the whole uh, time estimation problem. And we choose the demerau Everstein similarity uh, for, the, for the, activity, uh, the activity similarity of the whole trace. The DDL similarity is uh, basically one minus the normalized amaral Everstein distance, which is the, the minimum number of the Letitia insertion, substitution, and transposition operations needed to uh, transform one string into the other. It can be seen from uh, the result that our performance for the next activity prediction are worse than the baseline of about uh, a relative uh, performance degradation of 8%, but on DMI, we, we achieved a uh, next event time execution uh, improvement of relative improvement of 27% uh, on average. On the, on the trace evolution prediction tasks, we noticed that the time prediction performances were in line with that of the one step ahead prediction. As we can see, there is a 21% average relative improvement performance improvement. Uh, though on the activity suffix prediction, we, we had a much greater performance degradation that uh, ranged between uh, about the 50% and the 66% uh, with respect to the baseline. We think that this is uh, because of the, of the, first of all, the, the common uh, error propagation issue. So a mistake at the beginning of the trace uh, prevent the, a, good, a good prediction of the whole trace uh, even in the future, in the future steps. And uh, second, we noticed that the, the system has a lot of problems in predicting uh, and more on escaping the one cycle activity prediction. Uh, so cycle of one activity that is repeated through time many, many times. And uh, we noticed that uh, truncating the, the predicted trace to the length of the true trace, uh, in fact, raised a lot the, the L similarity, almost doubling it. OK. Uh, to conclude the session, it is important to remark that, first of all, this is a preliminary study. So um, there are a lot of open issues still to, to, to be addressed. Some are the following. First of all, the reward function uh, can be refined in various ways as the, the current one uh, being a, a, bin a binary one is rather naive. And we can, uh, we can refine it in, uh, in various ways, such considering the amount of money involved in the whole case or maybe the, the cost in, terms, uh, in economical terms of the performed activities or even other metrics that could be uh, engineered. Also, the, the RL paradigm has, uh, uses uh, 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 an underlying model, which is typically a, a neural network model. And uh, uh, of course, we could use uh, different architectures. Uh, we used an LSTM, but uh, we could use any other model architecture, such as uh, CNN or Inception. Also, because Inception blocks uh, had uh, really, really good, uh, good performances lately. Also, uh, the, last, uh, the last two things that we could do is to first better coordinate the interaction between the event predictor and the time predictor, as the information predicted by one could be used as input for the other. And uh, second, we could use richer dataset or enriched dataset, uh, depending on uh, how we, we engineer this, how we think this, as uh, uh, more rich data set, for instance, could help us in preventing the, in leaving this one cycle activity prediction, maybe stating the, the 
how can I say, the, the success or failure of the performance activities. And uh, from me, that is all. Thanks for the attention. Uh, the rest of the, my time, I think it is good for questions. I could answer okay. any question. Thank you to Andrea for the, the, the talk. And there is one question from Anne Guin. Uh, probably you can formulate directly. Okay. Uh, because uh, you wrote something. Uh, what was about? Uh, what was the window sites? The, the question is about ah, the window okay. sites in the prefix sites. Sorry, I, I go. The window size varied. Uh, I go, uh, there we go. The window size was for the my we, we tried uh, a lot of window size. So we, we, we made experience with two, 10, 20, but all the all in the middle, the details of the precise number were in the paper. From 10 to 20, we jumped as there were not, uh, not many instances, uh, not many samples there. So uh, we kept 20 just to compare with the baseline. All here, uh, represents uh, the average over all the tested uh, length, uh, window size length. For the accuracy here, the, the results shown are the best uh, among, all the, among all the possible window size selected. For uh, even in the, uh, in the red words, I, I understood that uh, that was the criteria chosen. So the, the best performance was given. And that is the same that we did. The, our, our words performance was about 65% uh, of accuracy, if I remember correctly. Okay, there is another question that is an interesting point of discussion because uh, it is from Andreas Metzger. Uh, the approach is a uh, supervised. Uh, so what is the real advantage of reinforced learning with respect to traditional supervised learning? Thank I think you. it requires a long discussion. So one minute. Sorry, sorry and, for this question, but. <laughs> and uh, all the remaining on uh, WOVA, because you know, you can continue any discussion outside the, the workshop in the platform uh, using WOVA. It so is, one, 30 seconds. In one minute, I'll do my best. Uh, it is really an interesting point because um, thanks for the question. But uh, I try to, uh, to answer with uh, an example. Uh, think of the dog learning how to, uh, learning to sit at command. Well, uh, you, you do that, uh, the dog is a reinforcement learning agent. You are just learning, just uh, uh, training a, super, uh, a classifier that understand, okay, now I must sit, getting a reward. So it's true, this is uh, an highly specialized uh, approach of reinforcement learning, almost uh, uh, touching supervised, but uh, all the mechanisms are different and if we, adopted a full reinforcement learning, we would get too much far from the, from the baseline. So what we did was build a preliminary study, move this way, then our next paper will surely be, be a more uh, full reinforcement learning approach. But it is true, uh, this is very, very similar to a supervised approach. Okay, cool. So look forward to the next paper. Thanks. Yes, of course. <laughs> I, I will do my best to put it out in less than a year. Excellent. Great. Okay. Thank you for the question. It was really uh, an important one. Thank you again for uh, the talk. Thank okay. You. Now move to the next speaker, the last one of this session. The, the talk is entitled An Alignment Cost-Based Classification of Log Traces Using Machine Learning. And the speaker is uh, Mathilde Motelange. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mathilde Botelange from the University of Paris-Saclay. I'm a PhD student under the supervision of Thomas Chatin and Joseph Kormner. Today, uh, I'm presenting an alignment cost-based classification of log tracing using machine learning. It's a work that has been done with Benjamin Chetiwi from the University of Bergen and Laurine Huber from the University of Lorraine. So the context of this work is conformance checking. So there are organizations that record event logs and thanks to process mining, they are able to record uh, process, uh, to discover process models that describe the event log. Conformance checking is, the, is a subfield of process mining that uh, aims at verifying the process, the process model from the event log. One of the main uh, criteria in conformance checking is fitness, and it describes how well the recorded behavior has been modeled. 
we can use alignment to compute fitness. An alignment is a fact to find a run of the process model, which is the closest to uh, uh, a trace that appear in the event log. And uh, we count the number of differences between the run and the trace, and it's similar to the edit distance, and we call it the alignment cost. We say that a trace is fitting if its optimal alignment cost is zero. By computing the alignment cost of all the traces that we have in the event log, we are able to get the fitness of the process model from uh, this event log. In this work, we were wondering if we could use machine learning to predict uh, fitness. So can we use machine learning for fitness prediction? As it is a very first work uh, in this, this di direction, uh, we really simplified the problem to a binary classification of the log traces. Is a given trace close to the associated process model? We could use a, a binary classification that classify a trace as fitting or non-fitting to the process model, but it, in order to be more flexible, we decided to use a threshold on the alignment cost. So can we align a given trace for an alignment cost threshold to TAC where TAC is a given uh, number? So we have the event log, a process model and an alignment cost threshold, and we want to get a binary classification of the trace which are far from the process model or close to the process model. This relates to some paper uh, of the literature that I did some binary classifications uh, of deviant and compliant traces. In some cases, they knew uh, the label of the traces, so they knew if the uh, traces was, uh, were deviant or compliant. And uh, in other cases, they used the attributes to determine the deviant cases. They used machine learning uh, methods to do the classification. The main difference between their work and R is that we use a model as a base of the classification. So we can say that we are doing a conformance checking like classification. There are also some process discovery contests that ask the applicants to, do, to give a classification um, of the process instances instead of applying uh, an algorithm or a process model. So this is related to what we are doing. Our binary classification is defined by the following. So we have a process model M, a log L, and a given threshold TAC. And the alignment cost threshold based classification maps each log traces sigma of the log to one of the two cla class, the positive class or the negative class. A uh, trace is classified as positive if its alignment cost is lower or equal to the given threshold. Otherwise, the trace is classified as negative. For instance, sigma has a cost of three and the threshold is two, then the trace is classified as negative. So the trace is considered as far from the process model. From this classification, we found that we can get a lower bone of the fitness of the process model. The idea is very simple. We, we, uh, we see that uh, for the traces that are classified as positive, in the worst case, the alignment cost is at distance, uh, so the alignment cost is the threshold of the classification. And for the traces that are classified as negative, the worst case is when the cost is maximal and the fitness is zero. And then we have a lower bone of the fitness for the entire log and this model. Um, I've done uh, the theoretical part of the paper and now I'm going to talk about the experimentation. So this is a chart that describes the experimental setup and we are going from left to right. The first step is to create uh, the data, data set. So we had to learn the alignment cost of uh, the different log that we use. We use different log from the literature that, had, that have a lot of uh, trace variants. And we use different models from different miners. And here you can find the median and average of the alignment cost, which is important because we use the alignment cost as threshold to set the label if the traces are positive or negative in our classification. Um, we also created some mock traces, so with the same activities and equivalent length of sequences. 
And the next step is the trace encoding. So we use two kinds of encoding, the bag of words that encode the frequency of the occurrences of the word uh, that appear in the sequence. So we'll, we don't have the order in bag of words, but we also have a word to index dictionary uh, encoding in which the sequences of words are represented as sequences of integers. And in that case, we keep the order of the activities. We separated a training and testing uh, data set uh, to learn the classifier and then test it. We use two classifiers, a random forest, forest that uses a bag of words and a BLSTM, which is a recurrent neural network that can uh, remember from backward and forward of the, the activities. We did a CAFOLD course validation of 10 folds. Uh, in order to avoid overf overfitting. And finally, we did the evaluation step on the testing set and also the mock traces in order to uh, check the accuracy and the binary cross entropy loss. And now I'm going to show you the results. In this table, you can find uh, um, a line per model, a log, and threshold. In this case, we show uh, the threshold, which is the median of the alignment cost. Um, in this column, you can see the fitness of the testing set for the model, so which is the real fitness, and we can compare it to the fitness lower bound of our definition, which is based on the classification. We can see that the difference is high, which is expected because our fitness lower bound is the worst case. But when we compare the predicted fitness lower bound to the exact fitness lower bound, we see that we have a very similar fitness, uh, predicted fitness lower bound to the exact one, which can be explained from the accuracy. So we can see that the accuracy are always uh, high. Um, so we can well predict that the trace is far or not to the process model for the given threshold. Now one may wonder how can we set this threshold, which numbers, because in this table, we put the median of the alignment cost, but what happened when we change the threshold? In this table, we show the result for one log and one model and different thresholds. So of course, when you raise the threshold, then you have more traces that are positive. There are more traces that are close to the model if the threshold is higher. Um, the fitness lower bone uh, raise at, uh, for some point and then it will go down if the case is too worse because um, the worst case will be worse. Uh, we can see that we have a similar accuracy for negative and positive um, traces, so we are able to predict well both classes. Uh, and there is no much differences between the recurrent neural network and the random forest. For future work, um, we want to improve uh, our mock data because one of the reviewers pointed out that we did not uh, compare um, the, the random forest and the and then in, the, in the sense that we could use sequences with exactly the same number of activities, but in different order to see if the random forest can, will indeed uh, be wrong on the prediction while the recurrent neural network will uh, predict well this kind of case. Also, what can be good is to understand the classification. So why there are some traces that are far from the, from the model and which one are close to the model. And so we can um, improve the model. So for model repair. Also, we can go deeper in the prediction we could uh, predict the trace fitness, which is not a binary classification. And we could also um, do, for instance, a model a sequence to move sequence um, neural network that in order to predict uh, the alignment with the model move, log move, and uh, synchronous moves. Um, thank you for listening. And I'm really glad to answer to your question. Okay. Thank you, Matilde. There is a question. 
And uh, uh, Anne, uh, Anne Gay is asking you, what is the major benefit to classify instead of using the classical conformance checking that is implemented in the system and looking at the fitness? Okay, so alignment are quite costly to, com to be computed in some cases. For instance, when uh, a trace is very far from the process model or if a, a process model is very complex with many nodes, it can be, um, it can, can be costly to compute alignment. And we can imagine some situation um, with a web application, uh, which is a streaming application, for instance, and you want to have very fast results, even if there is a, an error rate, uh, we want to have very fast results. Um, so we can use this approximation, which is a prediction which is um, simplified from the real alignment, but can be useful when we want quick, uh, quick answer. Any other question? And also, just uh, I just want to add something. And also, it can be interesting to see uh, because we don't have much work in that direction in the conformance checking um, prediction. We don't have much work, so it's also interesting for research. Okay. Any other comment? Um, there is another comment. Uh, in real life situation, how do you ensure that also the negative trays are in enclosed in the training set? Uh, so the, you mean the mock traces, uh, the, the fake traces? Because you have a training phase. So I think the question is how you can uh, guarantee that also the negative examples, are, uh, the negative sum traces are included in the training set. So I, I verified that every traces that I test after the training were in the training set. So I don't know yeah, if I think it was connected to the real life application. Oh. When you are constructing a training set with some traces and you don't know a priori which traces are uh, conformant and which not. I suppose this is the question, but uh, clearly uh, the mm -hmm. jury can, uh, can uh, provide more details. I'm not sure I understood. Uh, so there are negative traces which are I don't know if I correctly interpreted the question. Uh, Jari, are you able to speak directly? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes, uh, you corrected, uh, um, uh, interpreted correctly. So in a, in a real life situation, you will, your process will not have, um, ideally not have a lot of non-conforming behavior in your ah. event log. Indeed, indeed. So if you are trading your classifier on on a really uh, in, on a on a biased data set with a lot of conforming by behavior, so how can you fix that? Okay, so I see what you mean. So um, I guess that the process um, model algorithm are not so good to have every trace uh, that are perfectly fitting. So you could set a threshold which is quite uh, low. Uh, in order to, oh, no, 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 sorry. I, now I understood uh, better the question. So maybe um, giving some traces that we know that are um, deviant can help for, for this problem. Probably but we, we did not do that, but. Uh, imbalanced is this. Sorry. Probably the issue is that the training set can be imbalanced because you have a few examples of the negative case and a lot of examples of the positive case. So the problem is that, is that how you perform the learning to be more robust to this imbalanced condition, or if you take into account this, uh, this aspect in, in this correct. No, no, we did not uh, take this in account, but uh, I think we could, we could shuffle the, um, the activities and verify that is not compliant to the process, uh, the business process, and uh, put a label as negative, for instance. But maybe indeed we don't, we will not have enough uh, cases. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I have to stop the discussion. Okay. And uh, thank you for the presentation. Thanks. We have a break now until 1445.
And uh, we have a last session after that with the three new papers. So be online uh, in uh, 10 minutes again. <laughs> she, did, she or he doesn't agree. <laughs> okay, thank you. See you later. Thanks. Okay, you are back. I think we can start in this uh, last part of our workshop. Uh, we will present the last three papers of our of our, this workshop, and we will follow the same procedure with 15 minutes per presentation. Uh, questions in the chat, please. And we can start with um, Louis' presentation. Thank you, Louis. Hello, good afternoon. Can you see the presentation? Yes, perfect. Okay. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luis Kishpi. I am PhD student from Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya. In this presentation, we want to introduce you the continuation of our previous work in the field of automatic extraction of formal process, uh, information from textual descriptions of processes based on the definition of patterns on the dependency trees that arise from linguistic analysis. We now um, incorporate a new layer of abstraction into these patterns which considers the relationships between closed sentences. The, the aim of this extension is um, to capture the relationship between sentences that usually arise in the textual description of, of processes. The um, first, first I'm, I'm going to summarize the basic original approach. And after that, I will provide details on the other extensions, which mainly consist of the extraction of relation between actions or conditions and different sentences. In the previous work, we present a um, proposal to extract business process elements like entities, actions, conditions, events, uh, and relations from uh, process textual descriptions, where the relations are only extracted within the sentences. The, the original proposal, uh, the oral original proposal, uh, the main step in the NRP analysis is the labeling of certain nodes as action. The, the NRP parser we use generates predicates, which are related to actions. Then uh, taking this, uh, this uh, predicates, we proceed to label as action each node of the correspondence tree. Uh, after the previous one, in this step, um, we use a set of predicates that check for syntactic structure involving conditional clause like if, whether, either, and the appropriate node in the tree are marked, marked as condition fragment. For instance, in this example, 
uh, we determine that a uh, system needs um, undertake an additional examination or conditions in the sentence. And uh, we will Similar to the previous one, in this step, we identify relevant activities. To do this, we apply patterns to, of course. In this case, the, the idea is that a subordinate clause is describing details about some elements in the main clause, but it is not really, it is not relevant activity. Thus, in the most, it, thus it must be removed. For instance, a simple sentence with the last pattern, the verb select would be removed as activity since the action is, is update. <clears throat> we, we also um, use patterns to capture relation between the previously detected elements such as response and precedence. For instance, in this dependency tree, the first pattern would extract the um, would detect that a range activity responds to same condition. A patterns used in our main contribution for relation extraction uh, summarize in previous dates. I need to capture relation between two activities mentioned in the same sentence. Uh, then the, the main contribution of this new paper is the extension of the, these patterns to capture also relation between conditions, uh, activities or the events located in different sentences. Uh, this, to, to achieve this goal, since uh, the pattern instruction framework use to regex, is able to hang the uh, single trees at at the time. We first need to join together the syntax tree for all sentences in the text uh, in a single in a single tree. For this, we add two kind of artificial parents, uh, parents nodes. As we can see in this slide, a paragraph node uh, has a children. Uh, the root node. For the same. Yeah. In the in the same paragraph, and a document node has a children all the paragraphs nodes. With that, we we obtain um, um, a unique tree for all the document, and we can apply to regex patterns uh, that span over more than one sentence. For instance, in the in this example shows a tree representation representing a short document with only two, two sentences. Uh, so um, in addition to the patterns within a sentences, uh, we now also apply patterns inter sentence. The rest of this presentation shows some of the main elements on this more general family of patterns. To extract conflicts, conflicts, we apply two patterns. In this case, uh, the pattern number one check for checks for a main sentence verb directly under a paragraph that has a condition as a child and that is right sibling. That that is a, the main verb of the following sentence also has a condition. Uh, this pattern. This, um, this pattern extracts a conflict between accept condition and other way condition in the pair of example sentences. In the same way, uh, the pattern number two captures the same kind of structure where when there is an additional sentence without a condition in between. This pattern applies to the second text, for instance, where the second sentence has no condition. In, in, this, in this batch of patterns, take a, it takes care of uh, extracting sequences, relations between activities in contiguous sentences. Uh, as in the case of conflicts, the, these patterns um, instantiate the variables original ref and destination ref to candidate 
subtrees that are then searched for activity or condition nodes. Uh, the patterns number one extract a sequence relation between the main verb of a, of a sentence uh, and the main verb of the next one, provided that the later has a modifier such as after, then, immediately, etc. Uh, the pattern number two and three establish sequence relation between an activity and conditions. In the example sentence, extract sequences uh, sent to field and sent to react, as you can see. Pattern number four and number uh, five check a um, similar case, but where the second sentence has some um, if-else structure. Then uh, this would extract the sequence relation sent, sent to accept and sent to otherwise in the in this example sentence. Uh, to carry out our experiment, uh, we, we follow two steps. First, from a human created model, we generate a gold standard annotation. For, for this, we use the model judge annotator. Uh, to, to get the results, we run our um, ATDP extractor tool and, and compare its, the, its results with the gold standard annotation that was obtained in the, in the previous slide. This table shows us the um, evaluation of relation extraction using only intra-sentence intra patterns. Uh, this correspond to results obtained using the patterns described in the previous, previous work, uh, which are based on extracting relations just within sentences. We only count extracted relations as right if they match the gold annotation in type con conflict and conflict and sequences. In, in this second Evaluation, in addition to patterns created in our main proposal, we use intersentence patterns. Uh, well, uh, it was described in previous slides. Uh, the, obtained the obtained results show that our new contribution extracts more relations, thus obtaining a large boost in recall with a very mild loss of precision. Uh, as conclusion, we can say that um, in this work, we have presented an extension of work or work extracting annotation from textual descriptions of processes, consisting in adding, adding syn syntax tree based uh, patterns to capture relation between conditions, activities, or events located in different sentences. Uh, as we have seen, the results show that crossing the sentences boundaries is highly productive strategy, since many relations can be extracted. Also, uh, the fact of using syntax hour patterns and, and not just flat regular expressions allows these extensions to be done with almost no loss of precision. Uh, finally, uh, as future work, uh, we are working on Panthers for text in, in other languages. Uh, it's all. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your talk, Luis. Uh, unfortunately, we will not have time for a question. Please continue these discussions in the platform. And now I would like to invite Stefan for the next talk, please. Luis, you need to close your, you need to stop to sharing your screen, please, Luis. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Stephen, okay, it's your time. Hope everybody can see me, yes. 
Yes. And I hope you can see the presentation. Yes. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stefan Lütgen. I'm with Technical University of Darmstadt. And I will present our framework case to back, uh, which is about, I hope you just see the presentation or do you also see the video here? This is my case, okay. Try it like that. Um, which is about learning representations uh, for business processes. Um, and it's about under Can you hear me? Yes, but uh, it's frozen in our slide. Okay, I will. Sorry for that. Okay, now it's working. Okay, sorry. Um, so again, um, it's case to back. We call it. It's about learning representation for business processes, and it's um, a way towards a step of understanding business processes better. Um, so we can use a good representation for many tasks. Um, this is kind of the motivation, and if we understand the process. Um, we can do uh, something like trace clustering or anomaly detection, all the predictive tasks. Uh, the problem is that most representations uh, have some, to some extent, are designed manually, and especially, and this is um, the, our edge, I would say, uh, we consider the process context, uh, because usually we only look at the, uh, the activity names or a series of activity names, the so-called trace. And if we take the case, meaning we incorporate the attributes like a department or a product, uh, we have probably better predictive quality. Uh, for example, if I'm working in a large company um, and I have to order something, uh, most likely the very uh, activity or the process steps are identical. Uh, but if I know at what kind of vendor I'm ordering, I probably can already predict what kind of item or better predict what kind of item I'm ordering. Uh, so this work um, is based on um, Virtuvec, which is a framework from natural language processing. Uh, developed by Mikolov in, back in 2013, had a huge impact in natural language processing uh, because it was a huge step also towards um, understanding uh, natural language semantically and not only on a syntactical level. Uh, and I want to give an example here uh, because we have uh, two sentences or two documents here. Um, the one is uh, gave a research talk in Boston. The second one has had a science lecture in Seattle. Um, and we're especially looking at GAVE research talk in Boston, and on the other hand, here had science lecture in Seattle. Um, and how can we assess similarity uh, with, with a computer or with a machine? Because as a human, we read these two sentences and say, okay, uh, probably we are talking about the same event here uh, to a computer um, at the classical so called bag of words model, uh, which compares the sentences or documents based on um, how many words are alike, the machine would probably say, okay, uh, it is not similar because these two sentences doesn't even share a single word except for I and in, but this doesn't count. So um, the way of doing this is we con uh, construct a so-called vector space. Um, and in the natural language um, case, we say word embedding. And this is the example, we have a two dimensional a vector space and how we do this is we crawl large amounts of, of text for example uh, wikipedia as a corpus um, and then we find if we do this over and over again that uh, in the neighborhood of, of research we also find a lot of uh, science okay probably not a question um, if you could mute it this would be tremendous um, we found uh, find research and related we find science in the neighborhood or at least in the same document, the same which lecture and talk and especially we can imagine that um, if we look at Seattle, we can also find in, in similar or same text, we can find Boston. So the idea is um, we project words which are close together in text or in the neighborhood of text 
also close together in the vector space we we are constructing. So we don't even care about um, the syntactical nature anymore of these words. What we only look at, for example, if I have Seattle, um, where does it lie in the vector space? And then I can say, OK, I compare research and science and see, OK, this is close and talk and lecture. This is also close in the vector space. So on a syntactical level, um, this is not the same, but on a semantical level, and therefore we could say, okay, it's uh, the machine has a chance of understanding the sentence better. It's actually close together because we find all these words in usual in, in usual uh, text close together. So if we want to do this process data, our idea was. Um, okay, we say um, a, a trace is a sentence and the, the single activities are the words of the sentence. Uh, the problem here is we have probably shorter sentences because a trace usually is not as long as natural language sentences. Um, more importantly, we have much smaller vocabulary size uh, because we have thousands, thousands of different words in natural language, but in process data, uh, perhaps we have 20 or 30 different activities. Um, but the idea here is that we try to understand the process better and we don't care about the syntactics um, that much anymore. For example, and I had this in the paper as an example, um, there is this activity called PR created or create PR. So to a machine, a syntactic, it's not the same, uh, but if we uh, analyze a lot of traces and project them in the vector space, we would probably see that PR created and create PR gets uh, projected to a similar region in the vector space and therefore can assess, okay, um, this is probably also similar to a machine, which a human could also assess because you could say, okay, PR created and create PR describes the same uh, activity, just with a different kind of verb. Um, this idea was already explored in 2018 by um, the coding called trace to vec um, he used the exact method I was just describing, only he was only looking at the trace, means only at the activities. That's what we have here. We have activity ABC, for example, construct the embedding, uh, group it as a sentence or as a trace in our case, um, and then we can do some classification, meaning um, if we did this with a process log, we can have a, a, a trace we have never seen before, and uh, this is called the inference step. We also project this unknown trace into the same vector space and then see, okay, um, in the PR created uh, case, this um, is projected close to uh, some kind of um, area where the process um, does something similar. And this is, for example, interesting for a trace, a trace clustering task. Uh, this was the trace to vec framework. Um, we extended it, uh, use, uh, naming it case to vec, because our thinking is if we use these attributes, this is highly valuable. As if we imagine, as I said before, we ordering um, some, some tools, for example, um, the very process ABC of ordering something is not distinctive to the, the very tool. But if we know, for example, uh, Max as a user is ordering this and he is specialized in some engineering tools, we can already assess, okay, probably it's some kind of, of tool X. Um, or even better, if you incorporate the vendor, we could say, okay, this vendor uh, usually sells um, the tool X to us. Uh, so this is more has more predictive power than just looking at these traces. Um, yeah, and then constructing embedding is, is, is similar. We just concatenate these attributes together. Um, so the elevation we did on two real life data sets. This is the BPIC 15, the famous challenge data set, and the BPIC 19. We started with the BPIC 15 because um, the trace to vec framework from the coning he also did on the BPIC 15. This is a building permit uh, application data set and um, the clustering criterion is one of five municipalities because uh, these are permit, uh, per building permit applications um, from these five um, different municipalities. As uh, attributes, we had an event attribute, org resource, which is probably some kind of user, and also as a case attribute, a responsible actor. Um, and the more interesting data set is the BPIC 19 because it's uh, 
it's way larger. Also, we have way more attributes. Um, this is um, sample from a multinational company, and uh, we have also a, a user attribute on event level. And on case level, we have a document type, Adam category, and vendor, which is interesting. And our um, clustering label was uh, item type here. Um, not item, item type. And we did cl trace clustering and also some abstraction task. I will mention that later. So we start with the BPIC 15 and only use trace to vec. Um, and this is the red line here, meaning we only look at um, the, the activities. We have some kind of improvable results, I would say. We, um, by the way, we are proving the NMI here, meaning we try to have a similar distribution over these five municipalities um, as the real distribution. And the closer we are to that real distribution of or can cluster into these five municipalities, uh, the larger the NMI. So we have a performance of like 10% when we only consider the activities, which makes kind of sense because we're dealing with a governmental process here, which is probably highly standardized. So only looking at, okay, we did ABC here, doesn't really tell us uh, with which municipality we're dealing here. So we incorporated more attributes. When we incorporate a responsible actor, this is this performance here, we already have a performance um, or we increase performance up to 40 to 50%. Um, the explanation is here that it's only 40, 50%, although this is a um, vast improvement, that some um, actors are probably responsible for, one than, uh, for more than one municipality. And then finally, we incorporate this org resource. We really have a highly uh, distinctive attribute here because we have uh, performances up in the 90%, um, meaning, okay, if we incorporate this very user, which is responsible for a, for a certain municipality, um, this works perfectly because we can tell already from the user that we're, for example, dealing with municipality one. Um, um, here, this hyperparameter optimization um, step is important because as I already said, we have sparse vocabulary. So, and this framework was optimized for natural language processing. Um, and we here have vector size here. So we have find the ve proper vector size. Um, we have good results because this is a bit fragile. Um, BPRC 19, um, even more interesting. Uh, trace to vec already performed comparably well, meaning we have only the activity names here. This is the, the purple line here. This is around 50% in NMI. Um, and since this is like a, a, um, a business company, we can say probably on trace level, the processes are already, process are already kind of distinctive. Um, taking into account, we are clustering towards item um, type here. Assuming we take item category as an attribute, we could already expect better results, which is in fact the case because this is here around 80% because item category and item type, our label is probably related. And this also is shown um, in the results here. Interestingly, um, if we use the attribute vendor, this is here, we lose performance, especially in comparison to only using the activity. And our reasoning was that, um, since we are clustering towards item type, that this company um, probably uh, orders a lot of um, the items at the same vendor. So using vendor as, a, as an attribute um, worsens the results because um, the vendor doesn't really tell me which item I'm dealing with. Um, and the takeaways here, I cannot just um, at randomly all the items I find in a data set uh, because it's not guaranteed that I have an, an increased performance. Um, next task we did, and this is in accordance with the idea that we have PR created or create PR, which is syntactically different, but semantically the same. And uh, our idea is to understand the process better and especially understand the function of, a, of an activity within the process. So what we did here, um, we left the data set um, as is, but to some attributes and to some activities, we just added random numbers. So we distorted the process a bit. As I said, like um, with the idea in mind, uh, create PR, 
PR created, like having a different uh, semantical level, uh, but on the syntactic, uh, sorry, syntactical level was different, but on the semantic level, like the function and process stays the same. And what we can see here, this is like a 5% and this is like a 1% to 2% difference. Um, but basically, it stays really robust, although we add um, different random numbers. And only here, if we um, distort like 50% of the activities, we lose some, uh, lose some performance. But basically, although we distorted some of the activity names, um, the framework can detect the function of um, activities and, and still has similar performance. Also interesting would be that we find functionally similar traces uh, which have different performance metrics like cost or time. Because usually an analyst will say, okay, I look now at every uh, yeah, traces which cost over 50K of some monetary unit a year. Um, but the other way around where we could see, okay, I find similar traces with different costs and we have a chance to find out, okay, why is this perhaps the case? Um, and an, an interesting side task we did was this vector arithmetic interpretability, interpretability task. Um, because in, in word to vectors this famous example of uh, king minus man plus woman equals queen. Uh, this works because since we're dealing with a vector space, we can kind of travel in this vector space if we subtract man but add woman again change the direction and then in fact and add queen um the developers of word to vex say okay this is interesting but i cannot guarantee that this works we tried it using this uh, artificial process here so we could better understand it and see dependencies than in this vast bpic data sets um, and this is basically a paper writing process from identifying a problem doing some related work uh, depending if we applied or theoretical, develop a method or hypothesis, do some experiments, evaluate them, and then uh, submit the paper, wait for the final decision. And what we did here, uh, we added basic steps here with add, subtracted the final decision, uh, so to say that the final decision was still pending, and um, deliberately left out conduct study, or this step here. And this is, in fact, the uh, uh, the top result the framework will tell us it says uh, conduct study uh, is probably what, what is missing or evaluate and um, as i already said and here's some because but uh, looking at the time i will not touch on uh, more examples here um, and this is uh, also a kind of the conclusion because we have this um, this interpretability task which um, delivers sensible results, um, but which are not guaranteed, but it was still interesting. So um, what we did as a conclusion, uh, we optimized the natural language processing framework, um, enhanced it with um, event and case attributes and um, showed with uh, trace clustering um, that we actually learned a good representation for this. Um, and for future work, as we have seen before, that just adding all the attributes doesn't guarantee Im improvement in the results. Um, oh. Interestingly, would probably like some attribute selection um, algorithm so that we can see what kind of attributes uh, have good performance towards some clustering uh, label. Um, and, uh, and, and the suggestion, one of the reviewers was interesting because we could also um, incorporate numeric attributes um, when we group them, like saying, okay, this is below 50K and above 50K as an attribute. So we could also deal with numbers because we also have this property in business processes and also uh, put more effort into this interpretability task. For example, uh, if we have, um, have a process we say okay we did this and that but at some kind of activity is still pending that the framework can tell us okay what probably is missing or something towards that um so in the end it was um, an interesting and a very useful representation for business processes um thank you for listening and i'm open for questions if you have one okay thank you stefan uh, i would like to emphasize that the questions can be made by the platform okay using okay. the platform considering the time Sorry again, I need yeah. to invite the other uh, speaker now, Jerry. And Stephen, you can uh, please leave our screen. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you for listening again. Thank you. Jerry, okay? Okay. Uh, thank you. If you can hear me. Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, good afternoon or evening or morning, everyone. I'm uh, Yari, PhD at KU Leuven 
in Belgium, and I'm going to present you uh, our new conformance checking technique using recurrent neural network classifiers. Work I did together with my supervisor, Seppe van der Broeke and uh, Jochen de Weert. So we are doing conformance checking, which is the part of process mining concerned with the question, how well does a certain model describe a certain log? This can be looked at from a global level over the event log as a whole, but also at a local level on trace uh, and activity level. So we have come up with a new approach to conformance checking for precision and fitness, which is fully data driven. And it depends on the generation of a so-called anti-log and to use a recurrent neural network. So to start, we use recurrent neural network or RNN. But since this has already been explained very clear by some of the previous presentations, I will only quickly explain how they work. So they are a variant of uh, artificial neural networks, especially useful when working with sequential data. So they can be, um, can the other person please? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so they can be looked up uh, at as multiple copies of a normal feed-forward neural network, one for each time step, uh, in which the hidden layers between these copies are connected. So this connection can be one or bidirectional, and there are multiple variants. Uh, these are mostly important when you uh, have possible long-term effects, uh, for example, LSTMs or GRUs. For now, uh, we use the following specific configuration. So we start with a process instance or trace, which is converted to a sequence of one hot encoded activities. Uh, these one hot uh, vectors are then reduced in dimension size in an embedding layer. And the next layer is a connected recurrent layer. And we end with a dense layer, which classifies the sequence as a probability of it being either real trace or anti-log trace, uh, which will be explained later. Uh, for now, our global conformance checking, um, we only consider the output at the last time step, but we are also considering using the output at the other time steps to try and estimate at which time step the non-conformance starts exactly. So how does the actual technique work? For now, we, um, our technique is dependent on the simulation of the model to obtain a so-called model log. So the technique is actually a log-log technique, but by playing out the model, it becomes a log-model technique. Then we need to simulate an anti-log. This anti-log tries to capture non-conforming behavior. We need this because we do not have negative data to train our RNN on. For now, we generate the traces in this anti-log randomly from the activity vocabulary, but also other approaches might be interesting here. We then train the RNN on either the real event log and its anti-log or the model log and its anti-log, depending on whether we want to calculate precision or recall. We then put through the other log and use the output of the prediction on these traces as the recall or precision value. So for the global conformance uh, checking value, we use either the average probability, we can, we can call this prop, or the percentage of traces scoring a value above a certain threshold. For now, this was 0.5, and we call this count. So again, we start by simulating the model to obtain a model log. If you want to calculate the recall, we generate a model anti-log and, and train the RNN to classify traces as either model log or model anti-log. We then put the event log through this RNN and therefore measure how well the event log traces are similar to either model or model anti-log. So we measure if the model log describes the event log properly, which is recall or fitness. Uh, we can do the same, but the other way around, and then we get precision. And if you put these two together, you get this nice graph. Uh, of course, we need to test uh, this technique. And as a proof of concept for its potential in global conformance checking, we have used this simple event log uh, used in other literature as well. We used 11 different models with different recalls and precision. These were supplemented with a couple of models discovered with discovery algorithms. And for each of these models, we calculated both the average probability value and the count value as described before for recall and precision and together with a standard error. 
We then compared this with techniques from literature, namely alignment-based behavioral and Markovian precision and recall. Uh, these were the results of this experiment. Uh, I will not bore you guys with reading a list of values really quickly, but you can of course uh, check these, pre uh, these precise numbers in the paper and find the experiments on GitHub as well. But basically uh, our new technique seems to agree with literature most of the times. It seemed to only have issues uh, with overly general models, like uh, for example, the flower model. This is mainly because of the model simulation not being able to capture all of the behavior since there are infinitely many possibilities and the chances for the simulation to produce the exact correct traces is the same as of the random anti-log uh, to produce it. Uh, in other differences with literature, our approach is actually closer to the percentage of traces in the log which are actually correct, correctly reproduced. So here in practice, our method puts more emphasis on being able to reproduce the most prevalent traces. Uh, the problem with the overly general logs might also provide an issue when having too many loops, uh, but in theory, you can expand the model log to combat this issue. However, when while experimenting with this, we found that it is actually mainly the anti-log, which should definitely be big enough to collect enough non-conforming behavior. Uh, we have also already played around a bit with uh, other potential uses for the technique. One, which I already mentioned earlier, is using the output uh, at each time step. This would look a bit like this, we, where we can see an example of a, of a conforming and a non-conforming trace. And we um, see the output decrease sharply when the non-conformance occurs here at A, activity A. Uh, for now, this does not work perfectly, so are still, we are still trying to fix these issues. Um, because we get a probability value for each trace uh, to whether it is closer to the real or to the anti-log, we can also use the technique to produce, for example, a recall probability distribution, which might provide some valuable insights for end users. So uh, to conclude, we have come up with a new data-driven conformance checking technique. It is based on model simulation, random anti-log generation, and uses RNNs. It is quick, especially when strained, and uh, it has been tested to a certain extent and shows uh, potential for global conformance analysis. Uh, for future work, we are now exploring further local conformance checking pos possibilities. Another approach would be by using um, alternative anti-log generation methods, for example, using negative events or adding different levels of noise to a log, uh, which is certainly interesting to include in future work is extra data attributes like resource, uh, for example. This would, however, require slightly altering the model log simulation and the anti-log generation, of course, but um, it's, it's doable. A more drastic possible approach might make the whole model log simulation obsolete, uh, and that is by coming up with a way to directly use the uh, process models. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, attention. If there are any questions, you can uh, send me a message or maybe okay, ask them now. We have, we have a minute to reply a question uh, in the chat. Uh, is there a way to exactly calculate the maximum number of unique trace variants for a given model for a maximum case length? Well, uh, I did not uh, understand the question. Can you maybe repeat it? Uh, in the, could you check on the chat, maybe? Yeah, I will check but... in the chat. Um... Uh... It's... Yeah, it, it's po possible if you just play out this model, I guess. Um, but I, I, I do not see how this directly connects with, uh, with this research, uh, apart from the, the, that we also rely on model simulation. Um, okay. Okay, another question. But um, in the chat, again, are you aware of the work DeepLine from KAIS this year? 
it would be very interesting to see how your work compares the bidirectional Beam Search approach there. I think the approach are very similar, both being based on RNNs for conformance in checking. Uh, I have not seen this research, but I will uh, save this name deep align and I will uh, look it up for certain, for sure. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay, uh, thank you all. I would like to emphasize this, this uh, questions, that the questions could be made by the platform starting a, a more uh, deep discussion. And I would like to, to pass the word for Professor Cheraldo. Thank you, Silvio, just uh, to close this session, saying that uh, we are very, very grateful to everybody for the participation, to the authors for the submissions and for the discussion. I think the discussion demonstrated that uh, uh, it's nice to have such a workshop uh, in ICPM. So I think we can go ahead with a new edition <laughs> next year. Uh, of course, uh, I see, uh, Again, questions on the chat, uh, please uh, use the, the platform that is uh, a, an instrument for collecting also all the exchanges and uh, uh, to somehow save these exchanges. Um, just uh, to mention that uh, together with the chairs of the workshop on query manipulation and intelligence, we are going to launch a special issue we would like to invite the authors of this workshop to take part to this special issue. But of course, you are going to have a notification by email. And please also don't, uh, don't miss the next session that is uh, the context organized by the ICPM conference, I think uh, is a, a very interesting appointment where we can learn a lot from uh, the recent advancement in the theory of process mining. So thank you for, to everybody and see you again here at the ACPM. <laughs>